now for something completely different. What is the Renaissance? The Renaissance is this period in the 15th and the 16th century, after a thousand years of Middle Ages, where ancient Greek knowledge was rediscovered and improved. It was surpassed by Renaissance people like Leonardo da Vinci. And it was about the arts, like Michelangelo, but it was also about science and religion. The Renaissance was a battle between science and religion. And as we all know, the Renaissance started in Italy. Except that this story is wrong. I would try to show you today that indeed the Renaissance perhaps started in a Muslim country. That this fight between religion and science is older than what Europe is and indeed also perhaps started in a Muslim country. And I will try to show you that the Renaissance actually started in Baghdad. Baghdad was founded in 762 by the second caliph of the Abbasid Empire. The Abbasid Empire was the second Islamic dynasty after the Umayyads and it was rather huge. As you can see, it goes from it went from Tunisia up to China, actually. It started in 750 and it ended in 1258. In other words, it lasted for more than 500 years. The second caliph also wanted a new capital, Baghdad. And he wanted the city to be a geometrical, perfect city. You can see how Baghdad actually looked like in the 8th, 9th, until the 13th century. Round circles, perfectly done. Four gates, and between each two gates was 2.4 kilometer. The walls were 30 meter high. And as you can see, people were living in the outskirts, in houses and apartment buildings, while in the inner side was a park and a mosque. There were shops there, there were restaurants there, people were discussing there, walking around, but also hygiene was very important. A thousand hammams were in Baghdad alone, and also now and then they flushed the streets by the water of the Tigris River. At its high point in the ninth century, Baghdad would have had one million inhabitants. As a comparison, Europe, the largest cities in Europe, had at that time maximum 10,000 citizens. So isn't this a marvelous city that you can see? Unfortunately, it has been destroyed, but up to today, there is one small part of this marvelous city that is still being visible in Cairo, which is the Western Gate. And you can see behind the Western Gate a picture of modern Baghdad and, of course, modern Cairo. One of the next caliphs called Al-Mamun built outside his city the House of Wisdom. The aim was to collect all the wisdom in the world. Books about science, medicine, no space uh, traveling, philosophy and everything from the world. And in order to do that, they decided to, dis to translate everything that was around from Greek books, Sanskrit books, Persian books, Syriac books, and so forth. Here we see a painting of the 13th century made from this house of wisdom. What do we see? Books and scholars discussing. Actually, the books, this was the largest library of the world. Uh, and the scholars, interestingly enough, what the caliphs in the highlight of Islamic uh, uh, Baghdad loved to do was to bring a Jewish scholar a Christian and a Muslim together and made them discuss on one topic. It was forbidden to talk and to discuss with religious arguments. You can only use logical, scientific arguments. And at the end, the audience could decide who win. However, these works were not just translated. They were also improved. And let me give three examples. First of all, in 9th century Cairo, there was a scholar called Al-Khwarizmi. He was the man who invented, who invented algebra. 
So he used Indian numericals. He, made, he changed them a little bit into Arabic numbers. Actually, these are the numbers that we are using, these Arabic numbers, and the Arabs today still use the Indian numbers. In any case, he invented this fundamental science of algebra. It comes from the Arabic word algebra, which is reuniting the broken parts, where you have a balance between the equal signs, the equal signs, and you can find new things like S, the X, which is otherwise uh, unfoundable. A second example is Avicenna, Ibn Sina. In Baghdad, as I said, hygiene was very important, but also medicine. They invented the hospitals there. And Avicenna was one who improved Greek medicine books that much that his book on medicine became the standard work at universities in Europe until 1650. A last example is Al-Farabi, a philosopher. He was actually the one that started to think about this first battle between science and religion. Why? You got these Greek sciences coming over, being translated, Greek logic from Aristotle, but suddenly there was the truth of religion. There was the Quran. So he thought, how can we combine scientific truth and religious truth? And he said, you know, my solution would be that the religious truth is for the masses and the scientific truth is for the scientists and the philosophers, which was called the double truth. The golden age of Islamic history ended, as said, in 1259, when the Mongols destroyed Baghdad and the House of Wisdom. All the books of the House of Wisdom were thrown in the Tigris River by the Mongols, and they say that the, the river colored black because of the ink coming from all the pages. But what has this to do with the European Renaissance? Remember, in the beginning we said the Renaissance is a rediscovery and improvement of Greek knowledge. And it was in Italy, as we learned. So the question is, how did it go? Did it go from Baghdad to Italy, and how did it go? In any case, the story that it was refound in the abyss is largely untrue. Let me see the map of Europe. We will see a map of the 12th century, 1200. Some changes in comparison of today. France was rather small. Hungary was rather large. Luckily, today, this is the other way around. But interestingly enough, not because of the Hungarians, but of the EU, of course, but interestingly enough, there are two green parts on the European map. It's the Kingdom of Sicily, and there's the Almohad Caliphate in Spain. There were some translate. these were the places where Arabs lived, where there was Arabic language was important. And some translations have been done through the Kingdom of Sicily and ended up in the University of Napoli and Sorrento and later Rome. But more, more important actually for this story was Spain. And let me introduce you to one other philosopher. His name was Ibn Rushd or in Latin, Averroes. He lived in the 12th century in Cordoba, the capital of the Caliphate in Spain. He commented on all the works of Aristotle and had also a few of his own ideas. One of the things he thought about and wrote about was exactly, again, the relation between religion and science. And just like Farabi, he said, religion is for the masses, science for the scientists, but he also said, Actually, if science contradicts something that is in the Quran or the Bible, we have to read this in an, as an allegory, in a different way. And this is important, as I will tell you a little bit later. They started from Europe, from Paris, from Oxford and so forth, going to Spain to translate all these Arabic words in order to find Greek knowledge. But they, found, they didn't find just Greek knowledge, they found also Arabic knowledge. This knowledge went to the new university, University of Paris, which was found in 1200. And immediately, Averroes had big success. He had followers following that much that one institution started to be very, very worried, the church. So they started to condemn the theories of Averroes, and they also said that Averroes was not longer 
to be allowed to, be, to teach in Paris. So what did those professors in philosophy do? They went to Italy. They went to Bologna. They went to Padova. And they brought their ideas on science and religion and Greek knowledge with them. And that is actually how the science and, and, and the Greek knowledge arrived in Italy. This debate on science and religion went on. We often forget that. But for example, when Galileo discovered together with Kepler and proved that actually the sun was not going around the, the earth, but the other way around, the earth was going around the sun, and that the earth is also evolving around its own axis, the church demanded him to swear that it was wrong. We're speaking of the beginning of the 17th century. So in the middle of the Renaissance, they were still using the ideas. He was even defending, saying, read the Bible as an allegory, because then you, way you will understand science, but they refused, in the middle of the Renaissance. And let me go to a final picture, one of the highlights of Renaissance painting, which is the School of Athens, painted in 1511 by Raphael. You all know the picture, I assume. It's in the, all the apartments of the Pope in the Vatican. And in the middle, we see Plato and Aristotle. Plato pointing to the Creator and Aristotle pointing to the Earth as a symbol of science. What few people know is on the same picture, in the right corner there, is someone else. This is Averroes. This is the Andalusian, Spanish, Islamic philosopher who introduced the debate of science and philosophy in Europe. The people in the Renaissance knew this. They recognized this. They knew that the Renaissance had origins in the Arabic world, that had origins in a Muslim country, and had origins in Baghdad. Perhaps it's time for us to recognize this reality of our world history and philosophy again. Thank you very much.